those who fear him, Yara, Yahweh, Amar. Ooh, this is really interesting. Because before, it was the Israel, and it was the house of Aaron, and then it says, those who fear him, the Lord, Amar. The Lord says. Those who love the Lord say. Anyway, um, this says, in anguish, mensa, tightness in my guts. I choir called out to Yahweh. The problem with the Hebrew, too, is a lot of it's based in the clinching. So it's based in what does the indicator for the verb or the noun, where does it point to? And so in English, it makes little sense to us because the words, but because of the, the prefix and suffix or the change of the verb or change of the noun, again, I don't want to use that part. Anyway, the only stop of last week was, in my mezzo, the tightness of my guts, I quar, I called out to Yahweh. And he, Anan, he paid attention, setting me free, Merchab. And I told you that Merchab means to place you in a large place. So the assumption in the Hebraic culture is you are always surrounded. And we're going to get there. We're going to see that. But you can be in a large place, which gives you freedom. So you're, you're always corralled somehow. Now, you know, you can take this a long ways. But you need to think about this. For example, what, what would they think they are corralled by? But matter of fact, that is really interesting because remember in the New Testament era, what words did they use to describe the law? They said they were blank to the Torah. Yoked. Yoked to the Torah. That's a term used by the rabbinical thinking. It's used back Septuagint period. And you remember what Jesus said to them? My yoke is easy. My yoke is easy. Right? Because the term was, you are yoked to the Torah. So the boundaries that are around the people are what? The Torah. And what else? What else bounds them? What physically bounds them? City walls. If you want to do that. You could do that. You say city walls. Other nations, right? The other nations are around them. We're going to get to that. We're going to see that specifically. Also, what else bounds them? The waterway courses bound them. Actually, part of Israel is not bound by water. But there are other natural phenomena that kind of bound it a little bit. Anyway, uh, what I'm pointing out here is, remember, Hebrew is, is Hebrew euphemistic? Yeah, it's very euphemistic. So therefore, when you see terms or ideas or concepts, what do you need to do? What's a good idea in looking at? Look at the context, but then... Expand and see where the euphemisms could take you. So let's, let's look at this. So it says, okay, the beginning it says, by, he made me merchah, he put me in a large place, which means gave me a lot of space. And then it goes on, it says in six, the Lord is with me, I will not be yara. Remember, those who yara the Lord, yawa, lara, Yahweh say Sheshed Olam and then it says when the Lord is with me I will not Yah points right back to that verse what can man do to me so contextually perhaps this freedom is concerning people other nations let's see Seven, the Lord is with me. He is my, get this, azar. Now, we tra the translation here says helper, but azar means surround. So the Lord surrounds. Remember I told you, there's a whole bunch of these surround words in Hebraic thought. Part of that comes out of the fact that they are what kind of culture? They're a pillage culture. And so protection means a couple of things. Protection means to be surrounded by, for example, walls or hedges, literally, or by troops or forces. And so it's interesting, the Lord is with me, and he has are, he surrounds me. I will look in triumph on my sana. And the word sana in Hebrew means those who hate me. 
Now, what's interesting about this, and you know, I, <clears throat> if it were up to me, I would translate this kind of differently. Because I don't think the translation necessarily takes away from the meaning per se. But is there a difference between your enemies and those who hate you? Yeah. Yeah. There's a, I mean, your sister might hate you for a period of time, <laughs> right? But it doesn't mean she's your enemy necessarily. Could be a very long period of time. Yeah, she could be putting cockroaches in your lunch. But, you know, the thing is that, you know, there's a huge difference between necessarily enemy and hate. And by the way, in English, we have you know, a huge number of different words we can use for the same kind of idea. But yet, the context here isn't bad, because remember I told you, what is surrounding them that is causing them problems? Because God puts them in an open place, okay? So literally, it says, Yahweh surrounds me, protects me, and I look over those who hate me. I look over those who hate me. So what could that context be? How could you look over those who hate you? There's probably a couple of there's a couple of concrete ways and there's probably some really euphemistic ways. I rule over them for one thing, possibly. Well, you know, if you're on a wall, on top of a wall, what do you do? You you look down on your enemies, right? On those who hate you. Okay? You can also look down on those who hate you if it's from a magisterial seat or from a place of power, you know, euphemistically from a place of power. There's, there's, there's a lot in here. You remember I told you this is poetry. And when you look at poetry, eh, it's just a lot of deep stuff. It's not just, you know, surface, and especially when you know it's not like Greek. I mean, if this were Greek, it'd be absolutely concrete. If it were Greek, I could say what? What is he saying if this were Greek? I look down from a wall. Literally, and by the way, you wouldn't see a construction like this in Greek. This is a strange construction. This is like Jesus saying, I am the I am the sheepfold, or I'm the I'm the sheep's gate. Right? And you look at it and you go, huh? Huh? Or Jesus saying, I'm the bread. And you go, okay, this guy's a loony. Right? Because in Greek thought you can't be bread, you can't be a sheep's gate. That's just crazy. He's crazy talk. See? But in Hebrew, that's normative. It's normative euphemism. And by the way, in English, it's normal. We're a euphemistic. We're a very euphemistic language. We do all kinds of funny stuff. Um, eight, it's better. Twelve, good. It's Remember like those better, best type stuff? It's twelve. It's good to take chaha, chacha, uh, chacha, to flee for protection. We've seen this word before. In Yahweh, than to batak, to hire, to hide for refuge in man. Look at these words. You know, we have turned the words, you know, the way they're kind of written in English, uh, they're not too bad, because, for example, to take refuge is pretty close to flee for protection. But the context here is what? What is the context? What is the absolute context concretely here? There are threats all around you, and you're physically being protected by Yahweh. And you get this picture of the wall, right? I get a picture of a wall. Well, where's the walled city? Jerusalem. 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 Now, is, is this an indicator, direct indicator of Jerusalem? Hard to tell. It could mean, for example, remember I mentioned those things, physical boundaries, you know, water boundaries, mountain boundaries. Where's Jerusalem? It's in the mountains. And if you remember, you know, I taught, I taught the class, um, I think it was a king's class. And you remember uh, the Israelis loved to draw the fight with chariots. When chariots were the big war machine, where did they like to draw battles? Into the plains. No, no, into the mountains. Because chariots are great where? In the plains. And they never had many chariots, right? So where do you want to draw the chariots? Get them up into the mountains and guess what they can't do? Can't turn around, can't attack you, you know, and, and by the way, they wiped out a couple of their enemies, uh, Syrians, a couple of times using those techniques. So, ah, okay. Anyway, there's, there's a lot of interesting stuff in here. Um, and by the way, the word man is Adam. The word, general word for man is Adam. So, we get that in there. It's better to hide for refuge. It's better 
to flee for protection in the Lord to, or to Yahweh than to trust that is batash, to hide for refuge in man. And by the way, I want to point this out. It's very important to point this out. Does anybody see any spiritual connotation here? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Really? Mm -hmm. Is there any words about spirits or souls or protect me from sin? We're talking about physical protection. We're talking about physical protection. Now, euphemistically in Hebrew, it can be broadened quite easily into a larger sphere. But does it imply anything yet? I haven't seen anything yet. Let's, let's see what we get. Nine, it's better. It's tall. It's good to chana in God, to take refuge in Yahweh, than to trust in, if the word is nadia, the generous, the generous. It's translated princes, which isn't a bad translation, but it literally the word means generous, the generous. Um, ten, kol, literally all. Kol is a word generically that means the whole of in Hebraic, Hebraic thought. Kol Goy, the nations, Goy. Kol Goy, Kaba, bordered, surrounded me. Bordered is, is a close translation. Uh, surrounded is close. It's not the same context as the surrounding by the Lord, but they bordered me. But in the Shem, in the appellation of Yahweh, and get this, this is beautiful. In the appellation of Yahweh, I mule. Mule. Oh. I need a pen. Here's the transliteration. M U W L. Mule. Now, the word is translated, the mule, the word mule is translated here as uh, cut them off. But the word mule means to circumcise. Circumcised. What's the implication? They converted. They converted. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? So, you, you know, okay. <laughs> you know, the word, translating the word mule as cut them off. I mean, they're getting there, right? But without the context, the context here is they did what? They circumcised them. Now, there's a couple of really good contexts in the Old Testament, uh, a good one and bad ones. What's the bad one? Do you remember the bad one? Convert or die. Well, remember the guy raped uh, the daughter of uh, Judah. I think it was right. the daughter of Judah. Circumcised and tricked them so they couldn't fight and killed them. And they man. killed them off. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, that's, a, that's an interesting context. I don't think that's the context here. I think the context is they converted them. What they're saying is, you know, how did, they, how did they solve this surrounding, the problem surrounding? And by the way, okay, if we're talking about, like, let's say a city, then how do you, how do you, you're surrounded by the Goy. It's not just the nations around your borders. What is it? It's people within your borders. You know, you have a city and it may be full of the, you know, Hebrews. But what do I got outside the city? I got all these Goy. And so how did you bring him in? They circumcised him. Now, by the way, what did, the, what did they do in the Maccabean period? For circumcision, right? Force, that's how we got Herod. Herod's family, Antipas, Antipas was forced to convert to Judaism for circumcision all the males. He was an Edomite, and he wasn't supposed to be. Remember, Adam, according to Malachi, is never supposed to be on the throne of Judah. And guess who was on the throne of Judah? An Edomite. Herod. So There's really interesting stuff here. Really deep, deep, deep information. Anyway, let's go to 11. They surrounded, they, Jacob, they bordered. They surrounded me on every side. They, literally, they bordered. It's a single word that means all that. But in the Shem of the Lord, I circumcised him. So it says, mule. Twice. And you know, remember what is this called in in Hebraic poetry? Parallels. So I get the parallels. Got it twice. It goes on in twelve. They swarmed around. 
kakab, they bordered surrounding me like Deborah. Deborah means bees. They surrounded me like bees. But they the, the, ah, they extinguished as uh, as quickly as added. Like esh, like burning um, quats, pricking stains. Okay, this is really interesting stuff. All right, number one. If your border is surrounded by bees, what does that mean? They're with you, right? Okay, now... We, we have the desire, and you can, because remember, Hebrew is very euphemistic. So we could look at this psalm as being about the goy around the borders of Israel. But when they start bringing in bees, what does that imply? Production. She's getting the point here. The, but not just that. What? Where are they? I'm in my village, I'm in my city. Where are all these goy? Not the countryside, where the bees are. Well, they're against my walls. They're clamoring against my walls. They're trying to get in. Right? Can you keep them out? Can you keep a bee out of a walled city? No. Do you see the picture here? Okay. Where are these goy? They're all over. And not only that, I think that's a beautiful image. Because do you kill bees? No, bees make honey. Matter of fact, the word Deborah. The name Deborah comes from this word in Hebrew. It means bees. So they're in Israel. Yeah. yeah. And what does it might mean? What does this imply about Israel at this time when this psalm was written? Is it all Hebrews? No, they were driving out people like they're supposed to. No, and not only that, what are they doing with them? They're being converted, and are they being forced to convert? There seems to be a desire to convert. There seems to be a desire. Not only that, the impression we're getting is they are coming in swarms. And not only that, look at what else it says. I, I really like this because it's beautiful. They bordered like bees, like Deborah, but they they were extinguished, the ka, like esh, like burning quats. Pricking stings. Now, there's a lot in there because then it goes and it says, In the Shem, the appellation of the Lord of Jehovah, I circumcised them. All right, all right, guys. What do bees have? Stingers. Stingers. Okay. <laughs> okay. And so they are, what happened to their stingers? They were circumcised. They were. Hold out. I mean, the euphemism here is really neat. It's also a lot of concrete in here. But look at the picture. All right? Very interesting picture. And you're also getting a picture of the time of this thing. Look at 13. Um, I wish, I was in the word, it says pushback, but it's not, it's the ha. I was pushed down. I was pushed down and about to nafal. I was, it literally, it says, it's not about, that's added. I was pushed down and fell. Literally, it says, I was pushed down and fell. But Yahweh Azar surrounded me. I was pushed down and fell, but Yahweh surrounded me. And 14, Yahweh is my Oz. Remember Oz, the great and powerful Oz? That's where this, the word Oz comes from. It means strength in Hebrew. The Lord is my Oz and my Zimra, literally instrumental music. He has, and it's Hayat, he exists as Yeshua. Anybody ever heard of Yeshua before? Yeshua is? Jesus. Which means? Salvation. salvation. Yeah, Savior of salvation. Salvation, literally. Yeshua. Uh, you know, now, what kind of gets me a little bit, okay, is, uh, all right, if you wanted to throw a theological bent in this, what would you throw? Yeah. Okay. Now, the thing I got about this is I wish that we had some better way of translating the word salvation. Because salvation in Hebrew means or is Yeshua. Yeshua. See? 
And so when you read the New Testament, you're reading it in Greek. Maybe the Greek speakers miss it. So what did they call him? Messiah Christ, the anointed one, right? So you didn't miss the point. But the point in the Psalms here, and what's really cool in the Psalms is, <coughs> the Yahweh is my Oz and my instrumental music and has Haya, my Yeshua. Now, okay, Psalm, Psalmly in Greek means it's accompanied by music. What do you think this is telling them to do? Okay, what do you think they did when they got to this verse, this thing? The music started. The music started. You see this? By the way, there were some Levites whose purpose was to do what? Play music. Play the music. Okay? But you notice what verse it starts on. The verse they say the name Yeshua. Now go back to the picture I gave you about John. And Jesus standing at the temple when they're doing this ceremony and reading the 118th Psalm. And it comes to this part about Yeshua, and guess what they do? They strike up the band. I wish somebody would do a little movie about this. I mean, this would be really cool. They strike up the band. 15. Quote, loud calls, rena. Creaking, a shrill sound, and this is cultural because in our culture, you know, for us, we don't we don't make shrieking, creaking sounds, right? We don't have shrill sounds of joy. But if you go to foreign cultures, you know, uh, there's when when people are pining against death, it's shrieking stuff. When they are joyful, it can be shrieking. That's cultural, all right. And look at this, qual loud calls of rina, creaking, shrill sound of grief, grief, and Yeshua, Yeshua, it's not victory, it's Yeshua, salvation, and resound is added. Uh, there's so much you can with this. The OL, well, the tents, literally it's a, a, a house or a tent visible from the distance. So in other words, we're talking about a flat, you know, desert with a tent on it. Of Tithkot, of the just. The Yahweh's Yamen has done, make or do, mighty Chahil, Chahil, force things. Let me finish this up, because this is really important. All right. It's described as joy. Now, it says joy here, but it's shrieking sounds of joy or grief in Hebrew. Why would you have joy or grief or both with Yeshua? Because it gets put on a cross, right? I mean, this is this is you can, this is a historical concept right here, right? So you can have shrill grief that is grief because of death and joy because of salvation. You notice the word that's used: loud calls and the tense. So we can place the time now because of tense, right? In the righteousness. And guess what the salvation is called? Although they translate it as victory, it's salvation, it's Yeshua. What did they call it? They called it the Lord's right hand has done Shahil. Now, if you want to pull something out of here that has great historical or theological or ideas. Is this the Messianic prophecy? Is that what you're trying to say? Prophecy? I ain't going to say anything about prophecy. I'm just telling you. That's astounding what we find in this psalm. And you notice how we translate it. We translate it in such a way that you can't get it from the translation at all. But in the Hebrew, it's very obvious the things it's saying, in my opinion. Okay. Any case, we'll start there and maybe get a little more depth, and then we'll finish the 118th psalm next week so we can continue on. Thank you, Father, for your word. We pray you to look out just this week in your name we pray.